May the words of the psalmist bring us together once again this morning as we join our hearts for worship. Hear this, all you peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. For my mouth shall speak wisdom, the meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb, I will solve my riddle to the music of the harp. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of my persecutors surround me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches? Truly, no ransom avails for one's life. There is no price one can give to God for it, for the ransom of life is costly and can never suffice that one should live on forever and never see the grave. When we look at the wise, they die. Fool and dope perish together and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they named lands their own. Mortals cannot abide in their pomp. They are like the animals that perish. Such is the fate of the foolhardy, the end of those who are pleased with their lot. Like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd. Straight to the grave they descend and their form shall waste away. Sheol shall be their home. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for He will receive me. Won't you please stand at this time for our invocation and please remain standing for our opening hymn of praise. Mr. Frank Moore, would you come and lead us please? May we pray? Father, we uh, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house and in your presence. We know, Father, you tell us in your words that where two are gathered together that you'll be there also. Father, we thank you for protecting us and looking over us through the week and bringing us into your house. Father, we pray that the, the words that are spoken this morning and the songs that are sung will be to glorify your name. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Our hymn of praise is hymn number 478. And we're going to do it a little different this morning. The first two times through, the, uh, or the first two verses the choir is going to sing, and then the congregation will join us to sing it again after that.
Good morning and welcome everyone to First Baptist Church Four Oaks. As we begin uh, the month of August, our summer has uh, quickly come and is quickly going. Uh, it is good to be here this morning as we gather together for worship. Uh, we do hope you'll take a moment and look at the opportunities for the week. Uh, we do have, beginning tomorrow night, church directory uh, photographs. Uh, if you've not had a chance to sign up for that, we have tomorrow night and Tuesday night, and then also a couple of nights in September. Uh, if you've not had a chance to sign up for those, the sign-up sheet is out in the foyer. Uh, please uh, find a spot over the next couple of nights. We want to fill all of those up. And then uh, if you're not able to make it tomorrow or Tuesday, uh, the times that we have in September. Also, the deacon board will be meeting this evening. Uh, deacons, we have moved that time to 5 o'clock, uh, so please just be aware of that. Uh, also, this morning, we did want to mention uh, that the nominating committee, our current nominating committee, needs to meet just very briefly, immediately after church in the prayer room. Uh, so nominating committee, if you could join Miss Ann Durham uh, there uh, right after church this morning. Uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. John Hatch for an announcement. Uh, Mr. John, of course, serves as our uh, deacon chairperson, and because of that position, he also feels uh, the, the uh, chairperson, or is the chairperson of our personnel committee. So let me recognize Mr. John. John? Thank you, John. Good morning. I have a sort of bittersweet announcement this morning. Uh, I'll read it to you. Dear First Baptist Church, Four Oaks, it is with very mixed emotions that I write this letter of resignation. Working here at First Baptist Church, Four Oaks, has been the best job I've ever had. This job has been the perfect fit for me and my family. It has been my pleasure working with John, the staff, and the members of First Baptist Church, Four Oaks. I have made Life, some lifelong friendships during my six years here, and I will be forever grateful for that. I'm leaving my job to keep Stephen and Megan's baby when Megan goes back to work. This is a dream I've always had. God has blessed them with a beautiful baby girl, and my, now my dream comes true. My last day of work will be on September 20th, 2019. Thank you for my time here, and I wish God's blessings on you all. Thanks sincerely. Deidre Park. Thank you, Mr. John. Uh, as Deidre's letter alluded to, uh, her son and daughter-in-law uh, adopted a baby within the last month. And as uh, they, Stephen and Megan, go back to work, uh, they've invited Deidre to keep the baby uh, this was a difficult decision for her, uh, but we encourage her, and as Mr. John said, it's bittersweet uh, because this is a sad day, uh, but we celebrate with her for this opportunity and what God will continue to do in their lives and what God will continue to do in our lives. Please keep our personnel committee in your prayers uh, as they begin the process of uh, searching for an individual to fill that position. Uh, please keep our staff in your prayers and our deacon board. Um, they work very closely with Deidre, and uh, a lot of good relationships are built there. And please keep the church in your prayers. Uh, each one of you uh, probably have crossed paths with Deidre. Uh, some of you may never have met her, um, but her work and her uh, sacrifice and service to our congregation is the, in the background of the majority of things that we do as a church. Uh, so please keep all of those things in your prayers. Uh, we do trust God with our futures. Uh, we believe God has a purpose and a plan for all of us, uh, even sometimes when uh, it doesn't quite work out the way we think it ought to work out. God is still in control of our lives, of each person's life in this world. God still has the whole world in his hands. With that in mind, won't you please stand this morning and remember one another. Like two Sundays ago, it's been in there. 
Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. Good morning. Ooh, that was pretty good. Um, has anybody ever played hide and seek? I think everybody. Some of you played last night, I know. Yeah. Um, can somebody tell me how to play hide and seek? It's pretty simple, right? So one person is counting to a number like 60, the other people hide. And then you try and find them. Um, so who likes to be the hider? I, I was going to say, I, when I was thinking about this, I was like, Delilah is like the best hider because she is tiny and she can fit anywhere. I've seen it in person. <laughs> I, was, I thought about you. What about the seekers? Does anybody like to be the seeker? Really? That's, do you like to be the seeker? I wouldn't, I, that doesn't sound like fun to me. Why do you like to be the seeker? You, you think it's maybe like a challenge or something? Uh, okay, that's, that's a little too intense for me, I think. Okay, that's a little too complicated. That's why I don't play games, because then I get confused and then I don't know what's going on. Um, so most people don't seem to want to be the seeker. They want to be the hider. Um, what kind of things makes it hard to be a seeker? Like maybe in the dark, have any of you played hide and seek in the dark? That makes it hard, right? With, yeah, it's fun, but it's, it makes it harder for sure. What about like if you are playing somewhere where you're not comfortable, like if you're at a friend's house, it's gonna be harder because you don't know where all those cool hiding places are, right? So it makes it a little bit more complicated. Yeah, yep, exactly. So, you know, it makes it a little bit more difficult. So what if you were the seeker and you knew that every time that you went to seek that you would find that person, that you would win every time and every time you went to look for that person, you'd be able to find them. That would make you want to be the seeker, right? It makes it easier. Everybody always wants to win. So, um, if you always got to find who you were looking for, Jeremiah 29, 13, and 14 says, If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and bring you home again to your land. Um, that verse kind of says that if you go looking for Jesus and you're trying to figure out who he is, why he came, um, pretty much any question that you might have, if you wholeheartedly want to know the answers to those questions, God is willing to, to let you find him. Um, so, and he just promises that I will be found by you. Not I might be found by you, I will be found by you. So that if you go looking for him, he, you will find him. That is exactly, it's in print. I copied it, well I did copy and paste it from my Bible app. So, but if you open the Bible, that's what it says. Um, so it says that we, if we seek Jesus with all of our hearts, we'll find him and he'll give us everything that we need, everything. Um, so what are ways that you can find Jesus? The Bible. the Bible. That's the very first thing I had on my list. What else? Praying. Praying. That's the second thing I had on my list. Y'all, did y'all cheat and look at my, my notes? What, what, what are some other things that you can do to find Jesus? Good. Are you kidding me? That, seriously, like that is reading the Bible, praying, and going to church. That is what I have on my list. Mm. And I also added talking to people about Jesus and asking questions about Jesus. Because sometimes like things don't always make sense. And we have, like I have questions. Like some things just don't make sense. Like I said, like why did he have to come? You know, all those kind of things. Like he wants to answer those things. And I think the more that you do these things to seek Jesus and to find out who he is and why he did what he did for us, um, once you kind of learn a little bit more about him, it kind of sucks you in just a little bit more and you want to learn even more about him because then you start to learn just a little bit by little bit. And then not only... Um, you, you learn to trust him and love him and then each time you know it continues to grow so it's kind of like a never-ending game of hide and seek except for like he really actually wants you to find him <laughs> um, he, he actually seeked us out first so that is also something that's really important so it is really important to always kind of in your hearts and even if you think you found him you got to keep searching because like he's pretty not i wouldn't say complicated but there's a lot to him and so like you should spend your whole life seeking jesus and everything and if you're open and you're willingly and wholeheartedly just like the bible says willing to look at everything 
you can find him anywhere. You can find him in other people. You can find him in situations in your life that you don't think that you're going to find him. But if you wholeheartedly seek him, you will find everything that you need and sometimes even things that you want or maybe even things that you want that you didn't think that you wanted. So that's to me, it's just really important to always seek Jesus because you won't regret it. Does anybody want to pray? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time together with these children. Um, please just watch over them and their families this week. Lord, help them um, seek you in everything that they do, in every aspect of their life. We know that you provide everything for us and that all we have to do is look for you and it's there. In Jesus' name, amen. As we spend a few moments in prayer this morning, uh, there are a few folk I want to mention, and then I'll open it up to the congregation. Uh, please continue to remember Rose Minshew. Uh, Miss Rose fell a few weeks ago, uh, dislocated her shoulder, and broke the top portion of her arm. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because of her blood sugar level, they were not able to do surgery immediately. Uh, so Miss Rose is still in a lot of pain, so please remember her. Uh, also, Jack Van is continuing uh, rehab at Rex Rehab. We want to I uh, remember uh, Jack and his family in our prayers this morning and that that uh, rehabilitation will continue to improve. Uh, also this morning, uh, we give thanks that Miss Effie Dunn is back with us. Miss Effie took a little tumble a few weeks ago, uh, but she's back with us this morning, so we want to remember her. And also uh, Sue Cannaday. Uh, Sue has been diagnosed with temporal arteritis. Uh, it's a, uh, an illness that affects an artery on the side of her head. Uh, so please remember Sue in your prayers. Uh, it is a treatable disease, however, it is not curable. Uh, she'll be taking some medication for the rest of her life, and uh, we want to remember Sue in our prayers. Um, also, Virgil, we want to remember him as he's in treatments, continuing with that. Please lift him up this morning. Uh, what other names would you all mention today as we pray? Ms. Mary. Uh, Jerry Moore. Uh, Jerry had a procedure this past week. Uh, procedure that goes into his bladder to clear out cancer cells and we want to remember him. Anybody else? We want to remember, oh excuse me Miss Patsy. Wayne, we want to remember Wayne. He is doing better. Uh, he is improving but please continue to remember him. Uh, also Steve Cheeky's mom uh, is still in the care of hospice. Uh, please remember her and Steve and Cheryl in your prayers. Anybody else? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tim Westbrook, uh, we want to continue to remember him. He had a liver transplant, uh, is continuing to go back and forth with that as uh, he is improving, so please remember him. Noah. We want to remember Noah as he makes his way to college. He'll be moving up there next weekend. Uh, so please remember Noah and his family. Anybody else? Thank you all for the prayers that you've been giving me over the last few weeks. I am continuing to improve. Uh, still no indication of why I ran a fever over a week. Um, and finally on Wednesday had the tooth extracted. Uh, if I ever use again, uh, I hate that worse than having a tooth pulled. Somebody remind me that I had a tooth pulled on Wednesday, and it was no fun at all. But <laughs> uh, that procedure did go fairly well. Glad to have that over with. But again, thank you for your prayers. Josh? 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Anyone else this morning? Oh, my goodness. What? Okay, Scott. What? Godwin family. Uh, the Godwin family, a uh, 14-year-old, uh, dove into a pool, paralyzed from the waist down. So we want to remember that family this morning. Thank you. All right. Please, oh, uh, Roy. Yeah. Most, most definitely been uh, kind of a tragic weekend uh, on the national news. Uh, of course, the, 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 the mass violence makes the news. Um, which we want to remember all those families that were affected by that. Um, unfortunately, we have violence uh, not just in those areas that we hear about, but other acts of violence that we might not hear so much about, uh, even in our own areas. So we lift uh, all those individuals who are victims of violence up this day. Anybody else? Renee? Yeah, yeah Winter Autry is going in for knee surgery on Friday, so we want to remember her. At this time, would you all please bow with me as we share together uh, the prayer that our Lord taught us. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Offertory Hymn is hymn number 354. Please take your hymnals and stand as we sing. This is the first time I've been deacon in the, of the month, so does this mean I get to preach? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say I have a reputation because this past week, my brother and my cousin said, you need to come to Wilson because we need some pat time. So I was with Christopher, and I said, Christopher, you know what that means? He said, it probably means you're going to go preach to him. <laughs> so, but I'm just going to pray this morning, so let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today praising your name and loving you and thanking you for the opportunity that we have 
at this time in our service so that we can give our tithes and our offerings. We pray that you'll use it, Lord, use our tithes and our offer offerings to bless you, to bless this church, and bless the kingdom of God. Lead us, guide and us, direct us, Lord, in all that we think, say, and do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> morning our text comes from the Gospel of Luke once again where we spent quite a bit of time recently. We'll be reading chapter 12 and we'll be looking specifically at verses 22 through 34. I invite you to use your Bibles that you may have brought with you from home uh, to turn to the passage. You may use a pew Bible that you'll find in the rack in front of you or if you have a digital version on your phone or on your tablet or just simply listen to these words this morning. Before I read the text, I want to kind of set the scene for what's taking place here. Uh, for those of you that uh, have your Bibles, look back at the beginning of chapter 12, verse number 1. Meanwhile, when the crowd gathered by the thousands so that they trampled on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples. Now that's interesting and it's important. Because when you read the Gospels, you realize something rather amazing. When you read the Gospels, you realize that there are a series of what I call circles of relationship regarding Jesus. Think of a bullseye, if you will, with circles that emanate out from the center. At the very middle of that bullseye, you have the person of Jesus Christ. Out from that, in the second ring out, you have those individuals that are referred to as the three, Peter, James, and John. The next circle out, you have what's often referred to as the twelve. Sometimes we call the twelve the disciples, but that's not completely accurate. They are the disciples, or they are disciples in the sense they are followers of Jesus, but there's more followers of Jesus than just the twelve. We probably should better refer to the twelve as the apostles. Emanating out from that, you have the disciples. Notice the verse 1 from chapter 12. 
the crowds began to gather around Jesus, he spoke first to his disciples. And then after the disciples, you have the crowds. Thousands upon thousands were in the crowds. Out from that, you have other groups. Sometimes they become disciples, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're part of the crowd, sometimes they're not. That's the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the other groups within Judaism of first century. They could be Jewish, they could be Gentile, they could be Roman citizens, they could be from utter, the uttermost parts of the world at the time. It's interesting to note because what Jesus so desires is that individuals move from the periphery of that bullseye down through the groups that they feel like they belong to, into the crowds, on to becoming a disciple, being part of the twelve, intimately being a part and listening to and following Jesus as the three. Until finally, Jesus has a personal relationship with each and every one of those who will follow him. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And can any one of you, by worrying at a single hour to your span of life, if then you are not able to do so small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, when Solomon in all his glory, was he not clothed like one of these? But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? Do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying, for it is the nations of the world that strive after all these things. And your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for His kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions Give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. May the Lord add the richest of blessings on the reading of the word this day.
The great German theologian Karl Barth is quoted as saying several years ago to pastors and to young theologians that they should proclaim, they should preach, they should speak with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Now what I think Barth meant by that was that we should always remember that our faith should intersect our daily lives. That our faith shouldn't be separated out from the lives that we live on a daily basis. That the faith that we profess shouldn't just be something that we say or do on Sunday or any time we gather to worship. But it should be a part and parcel of our whole life Sunday through Saturday. That our lives shouldn't be compartmentalized as faith over here, work over here, education over here, sports over here, entertainment over here, civic responsibilities here, family here, and leaving the faith piece kind of out on the periphery of our lives that our faith should be woven into every aspect of our life. Now, a lot of people have interpreted Bart's remarks from his context in the sense that preachers, the church, should always be about speaking concerning what's going on at the local level in the news, the state and national level, or maybe even in the world level. Now, rightly so, Bart could have been meaning that. Bart was a professor and minister leading up to and including World War II. He lived in Germany, and he became part of what's known as the Confessing Church in Germany. The state church had kind of acquiesced to Adolf Hitler and to what he had to say and wouldn't criticize him or any of his policies that put millions and millions of people to death. Bart said we have to have a voice as a church that when we see wrong and we know wrong, we have to proclaim it as wrong because the Bible entrusts us with that message and Jesus Christ calls us to do that. But it's hard. It's hard at this time in the 21st century, perhaps more so than it was at the middle of the 20th century to try to make the faith that we profess intersect with everything that is going on in the world. I mean, let's just stop and think one moment this morning. If I began thinking about a sermon on Monday of last week and wanted to address everything that had happened over last weekend or the beginning of last week, I'm not really sure that that would land where all of us are this morning. Because in the last six to seven days, there has been so much tragedy, so much loss, so much violence. Things that go on the international level between our nation and Iran and North Korea. Perhaps we could talk about that this morning. Perhaps we could talk about 
as one particular party of our nation's political system are trying to fair, uh, uh, vet out and determine who their nominee is for the next presidential election. Perhaps we could talk about that this morning. Perhaps we could talk about immigration. Perhaps we could talk about the national debt that continues to blossom. Just think about all the things that have happened in the world this past week. Think about all the things that have happened in our nation in this past week. A sermon I would have written last Monday with us thinking about what happened yesterday in places like El Paso and Dayton, Monday's sermon would not make sense this morning. Sometimes it's hard to preach with the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. That's why I think this text is so important. So important. Because it reminds us that even though we have things going on in our lives, things oftentimes that are happening that we have no control over. We worry about our kids and sending them to school. We worry about our jobs and if we'll have one tomorrow. If we're farmers, we're worrying about too much rain or not enough rain. We're worried about how to send our kids to college. We're worried if they're going to be able to find a job when they graduate. We're worried about them having their relationships with other individuals, both friendship relationships and love relationships. We're worried about the messages that our kids receive about the message of sexuality and how we're to live our lives of faith in all aspects of our lives. There's much to worry about. And Jesus takes those worries seriously in this text that we read in Luke. But as he does in the Gospel of Matthew, where Matthew records these words from Jesus, he reminds us that even though there is much to worry about, we should not worry. Even though there is much to be concerned about, that concern should not overwhelm our lives to the point that it isolates us that it keeps us from engaging each other in the world. Jesus reminds us that with all the worries in the world and all the concerns that we have and all the sermons that we could preach and all the Bible studies that could be pointed on so many different directions, the thing that we need to focus on as people of faith, as individuals of faith, is the kingdom of God. He does that to keep us focused. He does that to keep our lives shooting at the right bullseye. He does that to keep us bent on keeping the main thing the main thing. That as believers, as people of faith, as individuals who follow Jesus Christ, our focus should be on Christ and the kingdom that He leads. This, I think, is important because it helps us to remember that as much it goes on in the world and as much as we should engage the world with the things that happen in the world, we should not let the world define us. We should not let the world identify who we are. We should not let the worries or the cares of the world guide us and our message. Sometimes I feel as if the church is simply reactionary. When something happens, someone runs to a Christian and says, what do you think about this? What does the Bible say about this? What does Jesus say about this? It seems like we're constantly reacting to the things that happen around us. That we cannot have an offense because we're always on defense. And as important as defense is, as, poor, as important as making a logical argument is, as, as important as it is to be able to explain our faith 
in a way in which we can say, this is how I see my faith in God, what God is doing, how God is acting in these situations. I think we always have to remember that we have to re keep Jesus Christ at the middle of our message. That our personal dedication to Him and our personal following of Him should then emanate out as ripples on a pond where we are changed inside, we are transformed inside, our lives are transformed, we interact differently with people around us, with our family, with our co-workers, with other students. We are different from the inside out, and because of that, the world around us is different. Because we have been transformed, the world around us cannot help but change. It's a message that keeps Jesus Christ at the center of all that we do and all that we say. Over the next few months, you are probably going to hear a lot about the Great Commission, and especially the verse at the beginning of that where Jesus tells His disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. You're going to hear that at the beginning of that verse, it is not only a command to go, which may mean around the world, somewhere that you've never even dreamed of, but at the same time, it means as you go. As you go to work, as you go to school, as you go to the store, as you engage people in the community, as you're at a ball game, as you're at a pep rally, wherever you go, the message of Jesus Christ should well up in your hearts. You might not always share His name at the beginning, but His love should emanate from us every day, all the time, as we go. But before we can do that, Jesus reminds us that before we can share the message, before we can go and share and make disciples, we have to be transformed ourselves. We have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to be literally perhaps on our knees in prayer, reading Scripture, hearing His Word to us, humbling ourselves before Him so that the world will know that we have been transformed. Because if we try to share a message about something that we don't believe or we don't live, I guarantee you somebody will call you on it. Will we always be perfect? No. Do we know who the one who forgives? Yes. Yet we strive. The word disciple means student. When I first walked into kindergarten, I didn't know much. I still don't know much, but I know more than I did. I am still a student of Jesus Christ. You are still a student of Jesus Christ. We are all growing as students, as disciples of Jesus Christ. Perhaps that's why as important as Karl Barth's adage is to preach or proclaim or speak with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other, remembering that we have to have a faith that is able to engage the world. First of all, it has to all be about Jesus and our relationship with Him and the kingdom of which He is the head. This morning as we come and as we think about our own faith, our personal faith, I want to invite all of you on that, those rings of relationship to Christ. I, I want to invite you, including myself, to identify where we are. Are we in the crowds? Are we a part of the disciples? Do we feel like we know Jesus enough to be part of the twelve, that we're, we don't know everything about Him, but we're still following Him? Are we part of the three who went away with Jesus on those important decision-making times in His life? The Mount of Transfiguration, when He slipped away to pray, about whether this was the cup that God would have him drink or not? Are you in a personal relationship with him?
Have you moved in and out of those circles? Do you feel like you're closer today than you were yesterday? Do you feel like you're further away today than you were yesterday? We are students. We are disciples. We are still learning and growing and becoming what God wants us to become. But remember, it's all about Jesus. Would you please bow with me? Lord God, we thank you for this day. And even though, Lord, when we feel like we are overwhelmed by the world around us, and we admit we worry, you remind us that even though there are worries in the world, we need to keep our focus on you. Because we trust in you, we believe in you. And even though the worries around us are important, the worries are, that are around us are a part of our daily lives, that because of who you are, and because of what you have done, and because of the gift of your Holy Spirit, and because through faith you transform us, we can face the worries of the world. Lord, we hear your call to take up our cross and to follow you. And in doing so, you give us a focus. In doing so, you give us a relationship. In doing so, you give us salvation. In doing so, you give us hope for eternal life here and now and everlasting life in the time to come. In your Son's name we pray, O God. Amen. This morning as we stand and sing, may we be reminded of the focus of our worship. May we be reminded of the focus of our faith. May we be reminded of the focus of our congregation in God's kingdom. It's all about Jesus. folk that will be helping you sign up for our church directory uh, pictures, portraits tomorrow and Tuesday if you're able to do that. Also, nominating committee needs to meet with Miss Ann Durham immediately uh, after the service in the prayer room. As you go, please remember it was by the grace of God we were brought into this world. It's by the goodness of God we've been sustained even until this very hour. And it's by the love of God most fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ that we all are being redeemed. Praise all before you.
know what they're doing. They 